Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the EV Club. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, who is Megara Jayasinghe, um, and he goes by Jay, so you can just call him Jay if you'd like. And uh, so Jay is coming to us from Min Lei's lab at the National University of Singapore, and he's going to be describing some work that began in Hong Kong as a collaborative project, and then the lab had moved over to uh, to Singapore a little about a year ago, I suppose. Um, and I, I want to emphasize to everybody that this is, uh, I believe this is the first time that we've had an undergraduate presenting to us. So this work is from uh, Jay's undergraduate research. Um, and I, I, I think this is very impressive, the amount of, of work that he's been able to do here um, with his collaborators. So Jay, thanks again for uh, presenting to the EV Club today, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. It's my honor to be presenting our work. Uh, at the EV, ICAB EV General Club. And so um, as uh, Dr. Hunt mentioned, I am, uh, you can call me Jay. And today I will be presenting our work on where we developed a new enzymatic method for modifying the surface of extracellular vesicles. And we utilize this method to immobilize, to conjugate targeting molecules such as peptides and antibodies on the surface of EVs to achieve targeted drug delivery. And uh, this is the outline of today's presentation. So first off, I'll just be introducing, I think we are all familiar with EVs and uh, I'll just be introducing the concept of EVs as drug delivery vectors before moving on to explain these uh, mechanic, uh, the specifics of our enzymatic surface functionalization approach, which to the best of our knowledge is the first time that this has been used for engineering EVs for any purpose, let alone drug delivery. And I will finish off by demonstrating by demonstrating some of the data we have where we utilize these engineered EVs to deliver a variety of therapeutic cargoes to uh, can, mostly cancer cells. And we actually use a, theory, a number of different strategies to conjugate different classes of targeting molecules. And together, all in all, we have, we have data showing delivery of chemotherapeutics, small RNA molecules, and all of them to uh, specifically to tumor cells. And we show the treatment of xenografted breast cancer cells, breast cancer, lung cancer, and a leukemia model. And we show that these targeting RBC EVs are actually capable of uh, slowing down the tumor progression. So moving on, as I said, uh, we are all familiar with EVs, extracellular vesicles. And the aspect I would like to focus on here is that EVs, as has been shown in many, many studies, EVs possess many endogenous characteristics that aid in, in their role in inter intercellular communication. And many studies have shown the transfer of functional molecules, RNA, nucleic acids, proteins, and uh, other functional molecules. And what we sort of, we and many other groups around the world have sought out to do is repurpose these naturally, natural transporters, natural vectors to deliver exogenously loaded drugs specifically to decide cell types. And what we, uh, uh, what we the aim here, the goal here is to load uh, extracellular vesicles, naturally derived extracellular vesicles with exogenous drugs followed by surface functionalization because the reason for this is uh, very few naturally derived EVs actually have significant therapeutic potential. So we enhance the therapeutic potential we are loading. And as we all know, I mean, different EVs based on their parental cell types have different biodistributions and uh, different organotropisms. And we, I mean, the only way we can control uh, these, uh, the, the uptake of these, RBC, of these extracellular vesicles is by the, the easiest method at least is by modifying the surface and to a great part this is done by modifying the proteomic composition though other groups have also shown that modifying the glycans can also serve to help uh, modify the uh, biodistribution so we hope that the combination of ex exogenous drug loading and surface functionalization can lead to the development of potent naturally inspired drug delivery vectors and uh, these drug directors would, of course, uh, ideally have all the endogenous, thinly endowed characteristics that EVs have for intercellular communication. So the cargo would enjoy protection inside the lumen of the vesicle. 
have CD47 and other self molecules to decrease non-specific phagocytosis. And also, as I said, other glycans and lipids and protein, proteins on the surface, which can be modified as desired. And for our group, our group actually focuses on using RBC EVs for drug delivery for the most part. And uh, the reason for this is primarily that our red blood cell EVs are one, uh, first off, we have a, a protocol for purifying extremely large amounts of extracellular vesicles, which we published in our first paper in NatureCom way back in 2018. And also red blood cell EVs uh, are derived from red blood cells and red blood cells have no nuclear, no, nu no genomic uh, DNA at least, which reduces the risk of defense of any oncogenic or unwanted denucleic acids to the EVs and thereby to the recipient cells. And in this way, we uh, this we have this, we use uh, red blood cell derived EVs for which we subsequently engineer, load with exogenous drugs, and use for drug delivery. And as um, you know, uh, our basic EVs are microvesicles, and it's just as a characterization of the red blood cell EVs that we have isolated and purified using our protocols. So as you can see, they're microvesicles, and they're enriched in these traditional EV markers, Alex and TSG101, as you can see in the Western blot here. They're also enriched in EV proteins. They, are, they have hemoglobin as a marker of red blood cells. They also have, are enriched in the GP, uh, in GPA, or glycoporin A, uh, RBC, EV, RBC membrane protein. And as you can see, much of the cytoskeletal spectrin and chirin is mostly depleted in RBC EVs. Uh, we also did uh, EM, uh, transmi transmission electron microscopy and cryo EM for these extracellular vesicles. And you can see that these EVs, uh, you can see the cryo EM that they possess a lipid bilayer, uh, enclosed in a lipid bilayer. And uh, the TEM also shows the cup shape morphology that is characteristic of EVs, uh, ex exosomes and extracellular vesicles in general. The protocol that we use usually results in the production of a very homogeneous population, uh, at least in terms of size. Uh, we see uh, uh, EVs ranging from between 100 to 200 and 200 nanometers for the most part, with the peak being around 160 nanometers in average. We also, I mean, we all know that RBC, uh, that extracellular vesicles in general are taken up by cells, uh, by recipient cells, but we also verified this, uh, that RBC EVs purified using the uh, protocol that we use can be efficiently taken up by, uh, by cells. And here we use H358 lung cancer cells that were seeded and incubated with either CFSE label RBC EVs or a flow through. And you can see that uh, only in the presence of uh, the CFSC label RBC EVs, do you see the, RB, the EVs accumulating as you can track by the CFSC, the green dye? You can see that the majority of them start to accumulate in uh, vesicles in, uh, in the lysosomal system inside the, inside the cells. And uh, this time point was taken at two hours. And you can see that within two hours, the EVs are very efficiently taken up by these uh, cells. So, however, this is non-unengineered in the genus EVs right after purification and isolation. And what we set out to do in this project, so in the project, uh, so our uh, enzymatic functionalization method is to engineer these RBC EVs to uh, with targeting molecules such as peptides and antibodies, which can bind specifically to uh, cell surface markers on the side cells. And this would allow us uh, to achieve recept. Uh, uh, specific delivery of the encapsulated drugs to the cells. So we, following isolation and purification of EVs, we would uh, do exogenous drug loading of either RNA molecules, small RNAs, chemotherapeutics, followed by surface functionalization using the approach that we uh, will be going through in, in, a, in a few minutes, followed by systemic administration. And the key here is systemic administration as uh, it is very hard for most EVs to have therapeutic effect uh, uh, if they're not modified. So what we hope to do here is to achieve tumor specific delivery of extracellular vesicles upon systemic administration, whereby the EVs would uh, circulate. And once they do encounter a tumor cell expressing a corresponding receptor, they would bind to and be internalized by receptor mediated endocytosis. There are a host of methods that have been developed through the years. Uh, 
two isolate targeting molecules. Uh, I, I think the past in the past twenty years, or so uh, there have been many different uh, techniques that have been put forward for producing EVs with targeting molecules immobilized on the surface. And typically, I mean, generally, you could uh, divide them into pre-isolation and post-isolation. Pre-isolation is arguably the most popular, where you would genetically engineer. Uh, I mean, you transfect parental cells with uh, plasmids encoding the targeting molecule, either fused to a partner protein that is typically enriched in EVs, or through some signal peptide, which would direct these targeting molecules onto the EV membrane uh, upon reciculation. However, I mean, as you can see, there's a large class of molecules that have been used by a number of other studies uh, using this method. Uh, there's also lipid insertion or lipid insertion also arguably goes uh, together with uh, fusion with liposomes, uh, either before or after reciculation. So there's another method that has also gained popularity. Uh, however, and also you have chemical conjugation methods in the form of uh, click chemistry and other, I think we have, there were a few papers that developed uh, NHS mediated conjugation. Um, but what we see here with most of these methods is parental cell transfection is only limited to cells that can actually be transfected. So it is very hard on primary cells. It cannot be done on red blood cells, enucleated cells. And there's also always a risk. I mean, since it is, since it is done on nucleated cells, there's always a risk of horizontal of gene transfer through the EVs to the cells. And it could be oncogenic gene transfer, considering that a majority of the cells that we use are immortalized our cancer cell lines. Lipid insertion doesn't really encounter this uh, problem based on the EV source. But then again, there are, I mean, the conjugation where the lipid is inserted via DMPE, DSPE, or cholesterol is not covalent. And theoretically, it is possible that these molecules under certain conditions could may not be fully stable. Chemical conjugation, for the most part, is, it is mostly covalent. Most of the approaches put forward are covalent. But however, even for click chemistry, you still need some form of typically non-biocompatible approach to put the initial functional group onto the EV membrane. And I mean, the other approach is, gly uh, I mean, uh, metabolic engineering of the cell, glycan metabolic engineering. But once again, that can only be done on uh, uh, cells which you can actually, which actually have a nucleus and yeah, so back to that problem again. So uh, affinity interactions have also been explored quite a bit, binding to PS via C1, C2 and via NXN5 and various other forms of affinity interactions. But what we see here is uh, generally uh, there is either a risk of gene, uh, horizontal gene transfer here, or you see that the interaction is not covalent, not permanent, or it may involve some form of non-biocompatible interaction, non-biocompatible chemical reaction. And what we thought of to do is to develop a more biocompatible method, which can be done on pre-isolated EVs and is covalent and is stable and is not gonna, uh, is gonna be able to withstand the uh, uh, being uh, injected systemically. And we came up with this enzymatic approach where we would use protein ligases to conjugate molecules, uh, antibody molecules, peptides, specially designed antibodies and peptides onto which would then be ligated covalently through a peptide bond onto existing EV membrane proteins. Of course, there is some variation from EV to EV, which I will get to in a bit. But for the most part, what we do see is, is translatable across EVs and it is very efficient. RBCV, this is just the outline we use for RBCV peptide ligation. We have gone through a number of enzymes. Our JEV paper, which we published the, at the beginning of this year in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, we do mention using two enzymes, sautase and a new ligase, a protein ligase called OAAP, so uh, asparaginyl endopeptidase. And what we do see is that OAAP is the ligase is much more efficient. Uh, and it is also quasi reversible as opposed to thought is. So the entirety of this presentation, we will be using the OAAP ligase and red blood cell EVs for all the experiments. 
And what we do here is the basic outline which we use for this approach is we would design peptides with recognition motifs that can bind to the enzyme, the OAP ligase. So the ligase can recognize predominantly C-terminal NGL. And upon binding, it could cleave off the GL and transfer the remaining peptide onto existing EV proteins onto the uh, N terminal. So but what we see here is uh, there is some variation in what the, there is some specificity in what X1, X2 residues are. So it doesn't like it onto every single protein on the EV, which is important because you don't want to compromise important EV proteins like CD47, integrins that may determine organotropic matter, whatever. So uh, we need to, we, it is essential here that we maintain site specificity and not uh, non specific labeling of all EV surface proteins. And I will get back, get to which proteins are labeled in a bit, but for the most part, the uh, outline of this is we are able to get form of peptide bond, a covalent stable peptide bond between specific EV membrane proteins with exposed N termini and specially designed peptides. And it is very efficient. So we did a Western blot confirming that only in the presence of the uh, RBZ EVs with the enzyme and the peptide do you see. Uh, we see two very thick bands at approximately 35 and 40. And we assume that there is at least two proteins somewhere around 40 kDA, kilodalton, that are uh, labeled with the biotin letter peptide. So here we just ligate a biotin letter peptide and block with structure in HRP. And in the absence of the enzyme, you actually do not see any covalent conjugation. We also quantified the copy number using a biotin letter HRP standard and the NTA, nanoparticle tracking analysis, and we were able to determine that approximately 350 peptides were conjugated per single EV. Of course, we wanted to see if this is also, uh, uh, if given the homogeneous nature, of the, given the often possibly heterogeneous nature of EVs, whether it was 350, or whether all the EVs were basically conjugated with a peptide. So we did single EV flow cytometry, a uh, single EV flow cytometry revealed that uh, the bulk of the EVs were in fact conjugated with the peptide. And as you can see, we reach almost 80% conjugated with the peptide. But what is significant here is that you do see a general a general shift of the population in the biotinated peptide like the EVs as opposed to the control. Of course, the EVs were very, very small. So the fluorescence intensity per EV is very low, which is a bit harder for the flow cytometer to pick up, but we are able to see that in general, the entire population does shift to the left, indicating that the majority of EVs are actually successfully conjugated with the biotinated peptide. And we also wanted to ensure that these peptides, uh, that this, we do know it's a peptide bond. Uh, the ligation using this protein ligase has been characterized in other papers but we wanted to see if upon conjugating, upon ligating peptides onto the EV, it would be stable at 37 degrees in serum as basically in vivo conditions, uh, just to verify that this approach is able to withstand the in, the in vivo conditions upon systemic administration. To this end, we ligated two different biotin-related peptides onto EVs, and we incubated them in EV depleted serum, a human serum, for up to 96 hours. And what we are able to see is over time, you do see, uh, we, uh, we analyzed the extent of degradation or uh, dissociation or whatever, uh, any form of uh, peptide removing from the EV using Western blood. So we, we, we monitored it every 24 hours. And what you see in the plot here is that generally you do see that the uh, amount of peptide on the EV surface decreases over time which potentially may be due to the serum proteases because this was incubated in, uh, at 37 degrees Celsius. However, what you do see is even at 96 hours, you still have at least 70% of the peptide remaining. And of course, I mean, EVs do not last in circulation for 96 hours. So we can safely assume that this conjugation is, going, is able to withstand uh, uh, the in vivo conditions long enough to carry out its function at the very least. We also want to ensure that uh, 
the conjugation, given, given that it's an enzymatic reaction, that it, that it is irreversible. So to this end, we ligate EVs with a biotinylated peptide, uh, biotinylated T140 once again. And following this, we wash the EVs and we re-ligate it with an unbiotinylated form of the same peptide. And we repeat that three times over. And what we see is what we would expect if it was reversible was that the band would decrease by a certain percentage each time you re-ligate with the non-biotinylated peptide as the biotinylated peptide on the EV is going to be replaced by a fraction every time you re-ligate. But what you see is for the most part, you do not really see a significant decrease. Uh, we also repeated this with a number of other peptides, indicating that for the it's seemingly irreversible conjugation despite the enzymatic nature of the conjugation. And uh, more importantly, we wanted to see which proteins were uh, label, were ligated covalently. So as, in, as I mentioned before, we use RBV EVs uh, purified using the same protocol. So for the most part, uh, I mean, the EVs, the proteins that are ligated are going to be consistent throughout the study. So to this end, we once again ligated EVs with a biotin led peptide, and we lyse the EVs and we do a biotin pull down to pull down the proteins that do contain uh, uh, the, uh, biotin, the biotin related peptide that have been conjugated, ligated with the biotin related peptide. And following this, we uh, we compare this with uh, unligated EV and we do uh, mass spectrometry uh, and we determine the enrichment of uh, proteins, which proteins are enriched in the biotin related pull down sample. And we did come up with quite a number of proteins, uh, 35 to be exact, that were significantly enriched, as, if you, as you can see from the uh, volcano plot here. And we cross-checked the size of the proteins and the localization on the membrane, whether they're on the membrane, whether they have an exposed end terminal uh, that is extracellularly uh, exposed. And we did come up with a, uh, five, uh, yeah, six candidate proteins, as you can see shown in blue, which do satisfy all the conditions mentioned before and also match the molecular weight on here, which is between 37 to 40, uh, 37 to 50. And of course, not all the proteins here are going to be conjugated. The proteins in red could be uh, proteins that are either ligated to a lesser extent or less abundant, or also could be proteins that have been pulled down through interactions with the candidate proteins, because the pull down was done under non-denaturing conditions. So, but for the most part, we are able to come up with six candidate proteins. And importantly, we, are able to, we were able to confirm that we did cross-check and these proteins are not, have not been reported so far to be involved in any essential functions such as uh, mediation of cells uh, or phagocytosis or any, for any essential functions that would alter the biodistribution or the properties of the EVs. Uh, we also did further characterization. I will get to the controls later here, but later down the way, we do conjugate our EVs, not only with peptides, but also with single domain antibodies and monoclonal antibodies. And I just, press, uh, just for uh, clarity, I just presented it all together where I should be sure that we assess the physical chemical characterization characteristic of these EVs before and after conjugation. So you have unmodified EVs at, at the, uh, the first panel here and then the first sample, and then uh, everything from there is either peptide ligated. So you have two peptides, two, bi two different biotinylated peptides, two single domain antibodies, and two different monoclonal antibodies. These are intact monoclonal antibodies. And you can see that the hydrodynamic diameter, the zeta potential, and the polydispersity index is for the most part unaffected. I mean, there is some variation and there is a slight increase in the size, but it's not significant for the monoclonal antibody conjugated EVs. But overall, there is no significant change in the physical chemical characteristics. So that is important because the zeta potential indicates the surface charge and the polydispersity index a bit to aggregate. And we can confirm that there is no detrimental effect on the EV characteristics after conjugation. We also, I mean, we previously verified using cryo-EM, anti-EM that 
the RBCEVs themselves have a very distinct morphology and they are intact with a bilayer. And we wanted to confirm that following lig ligation, these characteristics are not affected. And as you can see, following ligation, the intact membrane is still retained, it is not broken in any way. Uh, we, all, we did uh, a number of grids and it is quite consistent between all the grids and just a representative image here. Also using TEM and uh, you see more or less uh, similar morphology before and after conjugation, uh, confirming that this approach is very biocompatible. And once more, I mean, as I mentioned, the entire study here is conducted using RBC EVs, but for the for other for applic applicability to other EVs from other sources from other cell types, we also wanted to verify that this ligation is not unique to RBC EVs, that it is translatable to EVs from other cell types. And, while, and we did uh, purify EVs using the same protocol from THP1 cells, uh, acute uh, monocytic leukemia cell line. And following isolation, we ligated them as following the same protocol as we use for red blood cell EVs. And we purified the EVs using size exclusion chromatography. And you can see that uh, you actually see a much higher number of proteins are labeled with the biotinylated peptide. And once again, you do not see any of these bands in the absence of the peptide where you just incubate the EVs with the peptide uh, in the absence of the ligase, which indicates that it is essential to have the ligase to conjugate the biotinylated peptide onto the EVs. More importantly, this indicates that this approach is translatable to EVs, though in theory, I mean, in, uh, it should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, generally, we can confirm that it is uh, uh, translatable. So moving on to uh, demonstrating the efficacy of uh, this platform. I mean, the sole purpose of this platform was for targeted drug delivery uh, to improve the specificity of the uptake of the EV so that we can achieve better th therapeutic outcomes. And uh, to this end, we first wanted to target EGFR, a common marker in many cancers. Particularly in this model, we used lung cancer. So we utilized a previously reported peptide, the G11 peptide, and we modified it a bit to include the ligation motif. And as you can see in the outline here, we conjugate these peptides onto the EV surface using the enzyme. And we label them with a calcine AM, a dye, and we track the uptake using flow cytometry. And you can see in the presence of the EGFR targeting peptide, the RBC EVs are taken up much more, as you can see on the last sample here. And on the panel on the right, what we do is we wanted to verify that the increase in uptake is due to specific interaction of the ET peptide coated EVs with EGFR on the cancer cell. So we incubate, pre incubate the cancer cell with a free peptide, basically to block the EGFR receptor. And when we do incubate the EVs after that, we see an abrogation of the increase in uptake, indicating that this increase was in fact due to interaction between the ET peptide on the EV and the EGFR EGF receptor. And I mean, that verifies the specificity of the uptake. I and mean, once we did verify that this approach was working, we also wanted to ensure that these EVs actually do enter the cell and are not just stuck on the surface. So we did confocal imaging and you can see uh, we use CFSC labeled EVs here in the same cell, H358 cells. And you can see that um, at, we have an image of the low magnification and a Z stack at high magnification with the maximum intensity projection. Uh, and I mean, we did confirm that the EVs are in fact inside the cell. And uh, you see increased accumulation, very clear increased accumulation in this presence of ET targeting. And we also loaded RBC EVs with paclitaxel for therapeutic effects. So PTX is a common chemotherapeutic with many side effects upon systemic administration. And what we notice is that ET peptide ligated RBC EVs loaded with PTX actually show higher specific toxicity to H358 cells, to lung, tumors, lung cancer cells, which is basically, which further confirms that this approach does work and is able to deliver increased amounts of the therapeutic cargoes to recipient cells with greater specificity. Uh, we also went in vivo once we did confirm the uh, 
uh, that the PTX model was working in vitro. We use the same EVs. We have either control peptide ligated or ET peptide ligated, EGFR targeting peptide ligated EVs. And we load all of them with PTX using sonication. And we deliver these to uh, mice in grafted, uh, xenografted with H358 and cherry luciferase cells. And we monitor the growth of the tumor using luciferase bioluminescence. And you can see, uh, these are just representative images of bioluminescence. And you can see over time in the ET peptide coated EVs, uh, the progression of the lung tumor, uh, it's also topic lung tumor, uh, is actually slowed down to a great extent. And here you see two different uh, exposures just to avoid overexposure. So if you go back to the plot, you see that it is significantly able to suppress the progression of the tumor. We also did tunnel staining, and you can see from uh, the representative images here that it is able to induce higher tunnel DNA damage in uh, the ET targeted control, uh, sample as opposed to control peptide like EVs or uncoated EVs or even, in fact, PTX only. Uh, moving on, so we did verify EGFR. We then moved on to a different packet, CXCR4, and we used, uh, we used a already verified CXCR4 antagonistic peptide, T140, which binds to CXCR4 with high affinity. And what we noticed here was that the T140 is a circular cyclic peptide, and we were able to verify using Western blot and flow cytometry that this peptide is actually ligated much more efficiently. Whereas with the EGFR targeting peptide, we were only able to achieve about 300 copies, 350 copies per EV. Now we were able to achieve well in excess of 1,000 copies per EV, which we, uh, we possibly attribute to the cyclic nature of the peptide and the new design. But basically what we do see is a significantly higher copy number of the peptide per EV, uh, which we verified. And, uh, and we also did flow cytometry and we are able to confirm that it is significantly, in fact, better than TL5 uh, peptide uh, at, uh, if in terms of efficiency, at least. Uh, we use the same uh, outline, the same uh, protocol for conjugation. Um, following this, we incubated T140, the T140 CXCR4 targeting peptide conjugated EVs with CXCR4 positive cells or negative cells. So we have more than 13 or CEM leukemic cells our lymphoblastoma cells, and we have CXCR for negative neuroblastoma cells, mouse neuroblastoma. And you can see that in the presence of CXCR for targeting with T140, you see an significantly increased uptake. Uh, it actually goes from around 10% to 70%, well in excess of 70%. And we also, uh, we also wanted to once again verify that this uptake was specific. Uh, once again, we noticed that blocking uh, a blocking assay with uh, free CXCR4 antagonist peptide blocks this uptake. Moreover, scrambling the cyclic peptide to uh, neutralize the targeting ability also abrogates the uptake. And this verifies that the increase in uptake is actually due to the specific interaction of the T140 peptide with CXCR4. However, I mean, this is just uh, the CXCR4 is able to mediate targeting and increase uptake in CXCR4 cells. We moved on to conjugate, uh, to develop a bifunctional peptide where we have the CXCR4 targeting domain and a pro apoptotic domain using the very popular KLA pro apoptotic peptide. And what we see is when we ligate this bifunctional peptide, we are in fact, primarily, we are in fact able to. Uh, maintain the specificity for CXCR4. Uh, the, the blue bar is T140 only, and then the red bar is uh, the bifunctional peptide, which has both targeting and apoptotic capability. And what we see with uh, an actin 5 PISA is that this bifunctional peptide is able to induce increased cell that you actually see the development of a new population here of dead cells. And it is much more potent than any of the other controls, KLA only or T140 only. And uh, following this, once again, we wanted to verify this in vivo. So we uh, established a leukemia model uh, where we uh, injected more than 13 uh, luciferase cells into the terrain, allowed uh, the leukemia to develop. And then we do bioluminescent readings along with treatment every two days with T140 or control peptide ligated EVs. 
and we are able to observe a significant difference in regression of the prog uh, tumor progression, uh, leukemia progression uh, by 14 days. And this is only observed in the presence of the T140KLA. And you have a uh, representative bioluminescent images here verifying this. We also did HNA staining of the spleen to track infiltration of the leukemia cells. Uh, as you can see, you can identify leukemia cells by the larger and lighter colored nuclei as opposed to the smaller nuclei of the spleen cells. And you see, as opposed to the very high infiltration in the untreated control and the EVs, you see the highest therapeutic effect is seen in T140KLA where you see very little infiltration and greater retention of the original splenic cells. We also did a survival uh, curve where we see that only T140KLA EVs are able to provide a significant difference from the untreated control, uh, as opposed to the other controls which, have, which do not have a significant effect. Um, our JEV paper also, in addition to drug delivery, we also addressed another common problem associated with EVs in the form of half-life. So, I mean, especially in terms of drug delivery, we noticed that EVs have, for the most part, a very short half-life, ranging from a few minutes to a few hours. And what we sought to do is to see if we could increase this. So we previously reviewed in our review in seminars in cancer biology, the different strategies that have been used by groups throughout the years to increase the stealth properties of EVs to decrease phagocytosis like pegylation, CD47 overexpression, glycan modification, masking of PS, and so on. And we analyze our red blood cell EVs. And we do see that the majority of the RBC EVs do have CD47. They also have PS. So CD47 is antiphagocytotic, and CD PS is prophagocytotic, which is not as desirable. And we do, did notice that our RBC EVs do not have an overly long half-life, which it generally ranges to around a few minutes to within an hour. So what we thought to do is to, over, to increase the expression of CD47, to increase the antiphagocytotic uh, signals. And for this end, we used a self-peptide derived from CD47 that mimics the loop on CD47. And upon ligation of this self-peptide onto the EVs, we see that these EVs are actually taken up less by THP1 and molem 13 cells, which are monocytic and myeloid cells capable of phagocytosis. Upon injection in vivo and tracking the uh, circulation half-life, we see that the self-peptide ligated EVs shown in red do show a significant increase in half-life, especially by the 15 minute time point. Of course, we could not track the EVs beyond 15 minutes as our method was not uh, sensitive enough, but we do see that the self peptide is capable of prolonging the half-life, the circulatory half-life of the EVs. And this technically is applicable to other EVs as well. Uh, of course, so far, the, ligation, the data has all been on peptide ligation using uh, targeting peptides or CD47 derived peptides. We also did some experiments on antibody conjugation. Unfortunately, the enzyme is not able to efficiently conjugate even single domain antibodies onto the EV surface in a single step. So we actually utilize a link peptide in the middle where we ligate a link peptide onto the EV, which is then ligated with the single domain antibody, which we also express in a modified form with the ligation motif. So both steps are done with ligation, but there are two steps. And we confirmed the covalent conjugation using Western blood. What's good about antibodies is it allows targeting to a range of receptors. So we did targeting to EGFR, MCRI, and HER2 using uh, camerid derived single domain antibodies from EGF from uh, against EGFR, MCRI, HER2. And in each case, we see increased uptake only in the presence of the link peptide mediated ligation of that corresponding nanobody. Uh, we also went further with the EG, biparatopic EGFR nanobody, which we used, which we noticed was very potent. And we see uh, that it increases EV uptake in EGFR density dependent manner. And moreover, the EV uptake, the increase in EV uptake is maintained over time. Uh, we also uh, once again confirmed the intracellular localization as before with the peptide, and we confirmed it inside. Uh, more importantly, we use this platform to deliver luciferase mRNA, and we confirmed that we are able to increase the efficiency of mRNA delivery to cancer cells. 
and more importantly, uh, increase the expression of the reporter. And this could in, uh, actually be translatable to a number of different uh, applications. Um, we also assessed in vivo uh, biodistribution using once again HP58 and Cherry Phenograph, uh, just to, uh, so HP58 overexpresses EGFR. And we see that in the present upon injecting either ET peptide coated or EGFR nanobody coated EVs, we see significantly greater accumulation of these EVs in the tumor cells, in, uh, which were uh, in the orthotopically injected. Uh, so this verifies that this target, targeting approach using peptide and antibody is both maintained uh, in vivo and can, is capable of increasing the EV uptake in tumor cells, expressing the corresponding receptors. Uh, we also just wanted to verify that our EVs before or after ligation do not cause any toxicities uh, or immunogenicity. So we did a number of different uh, qPCR of different uh, immunodenator genes, and we see no onset of acute immunogenicity. This is done 24 hours after administration. We also don't see any liver toxicity, which is important given the heavy liver biodistribution of RBC EVs. We checked AST, ALT, ALP, and bilirubin, and we don't see a significant increase in the secretion of AST and ALT into the bloodstream following administration of EVs. Lastly, of course, uh, uh, once again, the linker peptide method is limited to uh, ligating even antibodies that are modified with the ligation motif. So we also use a streptoidal mediated conjugation method where we conjugate uh, EVs with a biotin-related peptide followed by incubation with streptovidin, which binds to this biotin-related peptide. And then we incubate these EVs with a uh, biotin-related antibody of choice which could be a monoclonal antibody, a single domain antibody, or in theory, any protein, which is biotin-related. And in this way, the streptidin acts as a link between the biotin-related EV and the biotin-related peptide, given its four binding sites. And we are, we are able to once again target EGFR using the same nanobody using this method. Once again, it is specific only to EGFR positive cells and does not increase uptake in EGFR negative cells. We also did a Kokaji experiment just to verify uh, that it was not because of unequal labeling of the diabetes tract or any other form of bias. So we co-culture EGFR expressing cells and EGFR negative cells, and we see the EVs accumulate at high levels only in the EGFR expressing cells, which are also co-expressed TD2 matter as a fluorescent reporter. And you can see that in the immunofluorescent images, that you see a significant EV accumulation only in the TD2 matter and EGFR double positive cells, and not in the cells which do not have TD2 matter, which are just uh, visualized using the nuclei. We also immobilized a monoclonal antibody uh, against EPCAM, epithelial cell addition molecule. And once again, we see that uh, using the streptidin method, uh, we are able to achieve cell specific association of the EVs with the target cells and cell-specific uptake. Uh, so your uptake increases only in epicam positive H358 cells and not in epicam negative molem 13 cells. And we confirmed this using immunofluorescent imaging. And it is inside the cell. We did confocal imaging with a VSAC. And you can see very clearly that there is a significant increase in e accumulation, especially in, with the use of the monoclonal antibody against epicam uh, and not with a control monoclonal antibody. Uh, we also did the delivery of functional molecules uh, using this platform. So uh, from here on, we use the streptivirin method uh, in conjugation with the EGFR single domain antibody. And here we deliver, we load all these EVs, either control nanobody conjugated or EGFR nanobody conjugated EVs with siRNA against DGFP. And we deliver them to CA1A DGFP cells, which do express EGFR. And we see that in the presence of EGFR targeting, we are able to almost completely deplete the EGFR, EGFP in the, in the cells, uh, the DGFP in the cells, sorry. And you don't see as much a pronounced effect in the absence of targeting. So streptivirin only or a control nanobody does not have as much effect. We also delivered a FAM conjugated NCASO in a similar manner, as you can see here. And once again, we see increased intracellular accumulation. 
But for therapeutic effect, we chose MIR-125B B as a target, a commonly associated, uh, commonly upregulated oncogenic microRNA, especially in breast cancer. And we tested the effect of on MIR-125 targets, EGFR targeted MIR-125B B knockdown in two breast cancer cell lines, uh, CA1A and 41. Uh, so here we see increased knockdown of MIR-125B with targeting, EGFR targeting, but you don't see, you see a less effect in the absence of targeting and NC has no effect at all. Uh, significantly, uh, any form of EV delivery is better than naked ASO. We also see a significantly significant increase in decrease in survivability, basically uh, higher specific cell cytotoxicity of one to five, one to five B ASO loaded EVs. Uh, in the presence of EGFR targeting as opposed to non-targeted EVs. We also repeated this in 41 cells and we confirmed that once again, uh, the 41 cells do express EGFR. So uh, with EGFR targeting, we see increased cell, uh, increased knockdown of mir one to 5 b and a corresponding decrease in cell viability. Uh, we did test this in vivo using uh, a xenograft of CA1A or allograft of 41. So mice were injected in the flank. And what we noticed is we were significantly able to deliver these EVs with increased, uh, increased accumulation to the tumor cells on the flank. And you see with EGFR targeting uh, using IVIS, we check the relative uptake. And the EV uptake is significantly higher uh, with, the target, with EGFR targeting as opposed to the non-targeted controls, which we verified with immunostaining for GPA, a specific RBC EV marker. So you can see in red, there is increased accumulation of RBC of GPA from RBC EVs, which has accumulated in the lysosomal pathways in the cells here in the tumor. As, and you see much lower accumulation in the controls. Uh, we also did a treatment as outlined here, where we precondition the mice and do EV administration in two doses and run QPCR for the tumor. And we see significantly increased knockdown of MIR1 to 5B. And uh, we see this both in the CA1A and the 41, though we see greater knockdown in CA1A given the greater vascularity of the tumor. But generally, we do see that we are able to deliver uh, uh, small RNA molecules with greater specificity to flank tumors by systemic administration. We are working on uh, expanding this platform, uh, improving our ligation approach, and working on new and novel targets and new delivery approaches. And uh, I would like to thank all the lab members of the Le Xi and Le lab who have helped and contributed to this project and the upcoming manuscript that we are working on. And thank you very much for your time and any questions. Well, thank you, Jay. That's a, an amazing amount of work um, that you've shown us today, both from your published, uh, published manuscript and from the, uh, the unpublished data that you have. And I think that you've, um, you've, you've shown some pretty um, amazing uptake um, that, um, that, that I, th I think many of the people on the call are interested in. So I would like to, to just start, though, with a kind of philosophical question for you. So why, why EVs? Why do you think it's important to put these peptides or your other targeting moieties onto EVs as opposed to other delivery uh, vehicles? What we do see is, I mean, uh, for especially for <coughs> for um, RNA molecules, uh, and I mean even other other drugs, uh, the vast majority of vectors that are used right now consist of liposomes and polyplexes in the for, uh, in the case of nucleic acids, the DNA polyplexes, and other nanoformulations, and all of these are not are synthetic; they are not natural, and this of course causes a problem in translation, but it's also potentially toxic, may cause immune reactions. And what we see here is a completely natural vector, which has been designed by nature for uh, intercellular communication. And what we hope to do is to repurpose this and use it for, use it to deliver uh, desired molecules uh, to the cells that we want to. Great, okay. so. I think in, in the same vein, we have some questions here about the possible responses of the organism to the administration of EVs. So I want to first go to, uh, to James Drummond. Uh, so James, please feel free to unmute yourself. But James is asking about the immunogenicity here. So you showed that when you administer these EVs 
uh, to the mice, you do not see an acute immune response um, as measured by, for example, some of the interference stimulated genes, and you don't see the liver toxicity. But James asks, what about immunogenicity when you apply uh, or when you, when you uh, 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 administer the EVs with multiple doses? Have you looked at that? So uh, we did not do the do multiple doses in. Uh, uh, we did not do multiple doses. Uh, we did not check for immunogenicity of multiple doses in uh, wild type mice, because uh, as you know, we use uh, human EVs, human red blood cell derived RBC EVs, and if we were to do repeated dose treatment in wild type mice, we are definitely going to get an antibody response against the human proteins. So we did not uh, check that, but uh, that was why we resorted to a more uh, traditional like uh, acute immunogenicity test, just to ensure that the accumulation of whatever hemoglobin or EV related, RBC EV related proteins would not cause any sudden onset of toxicity or immunogenicity. Okay, uh, James, you should be able to unmute now. So um, I know you have one other okay. question. Yeah, so... To follow up on that, um, you know, perhaps you could try a larger animal where you could obtain, you know, a sheep or something EVs from them, uh, because that will be the major, I think, roadblock to anything like this. Is you're modifying these proteins with great results, but also when you go to make a drug, you're gonna, you know, I would think you'd have issues. My second one was just what was your efficiency? You know, how many EVs do you start with, and uh, through all your process, your conjugation, what do you end up with at the back end? So with respect to just the conjugation, <clears throat> the efficiency of the process, we do not actually lose a great deal of EVs. Of course, like we do wash the EVs after conjugation. So we do lose about approximately 10% of the EVs from which we started uh, during the washing steps. But other than that, we don't see any lysis or loss of EVs during the process, just an unavoidable loss during washing. Um, okay. Yeah, as, uh, and of course, uh, it's a good idea to try the, to try like same species long-term treatment, and that is definitely something we need to do. Yeah, I would see this as, you know, maybe you could, if you could develop that, then you could just use individuals' own red blood cells as a source of EVs, perhaps, and, and get around yes. a lot of the immunogenicity. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it would basically be equivalent to uh, blood transfusion, technically, theoretically. With with whatever modifications you put in. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's that's a good point. So EVs and personalized medicine here. Um, let's move now to um, Ijea Daniano, who has a very interesting question about um, about what these RBC EVs um, might, might be doing. So uh, I was wondering uh, whether you looked at the um, possible side effects produced by red blood cell EV, uh, such as thromboinflammatory ones. Uh, is some recently have been described uh, in blood, uh, in, in the blood journal, uh, some... Um, this kind of effect. Did you look in vivo experiments uh, at uh, these effects? And the effects of trauma, I didn't get that, I'm sorry. Sorry? So whether, whether inflammatory, trauma inflammatory, so um, no. effect on platelets uh, and on the uh, thrombin, etc. No? No, we actually did not check. We did uh, CBC counts. We, did, we, did, we have done complete blood counts following administration, and we don't see a big, uh, any significant difference. We did not check for thrombin in particular. Okay, thanks. All right, so what about the function of the EVs themselves? We have a question here from Sabrina Noritaki. Sabrina, can you go ahead with your question? Um, so you mentioned that besides the RBC EVs, you also looked at another line, and that line, um, when you were doing the conjugation, you saw a lot more different proteins that uh, you were able to attach your small molecule to on the surface. And so I was just wondering if you had done any follow-up on that to see whether or not you see the same six proteins that you thought were good targets, or if it sort of changed that other um, so lines EVs in a significant manner. 
Yeah, so we did uh, we did use THP one uh, uh, cute uh, cute monosodic leukemia. We did not do a great deal of follow up study using the VVs because I mean it's really hard. I mean the protocol we have works great for RBC EVs. We're able to get large amounts of it using it, but the THP one EVs we are. I mean cell line is generally hard to get a large amount of EVs. And uh, for mass spec, we generally use about quite a bit. So we were not able to do mass spec to verify if the proteins are the same. We would expect it to be different given the, I mean, RBC, RBCs themselves generally have a distinct proteomic composition for the most part. There might be common proteins, but we did not check, uh, verify if there was any, uh, uh, anything common or sh shared proteins between the two, uh, the two, uh, the two EV sources. We also didn't, we're not able to do functionality studies. Uh, uh, you mean functionality in the sense that functionality of the EVs? No, just like in the same way that you kind of characterize the diameter, zeta potential, and polydispersity of the RBCs. Oh, okay. We did, uh, I didn't present the data here, but we did check uh, the diameter. The, we did uh, just simple, we didn't do zero potential. We just checked the size uh, using a uh, uh, nanosite. And, uh, we don't see any difference in size, but uh, we haven't done any further characterization for the THP one. But given the given that the protocol and the nature of conjugation is similar, we expect it to be similar. But of course, it needs to be verified, uh, as I said, on a case by case basis. Thank you, and also congratulations. This is really um, really great presentation. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask two questions here myself um, for Miriam Catalano, who asks, what is the ratio of EVs to cells that you used, I guess, in your in vitro experiments? Oh, okay. Yeah. So we did use, uh, uh, throughout our, I, I think, both our manuscripts, we refer to EVs in terms of micrograms, uh, but so generally of we protein. typically uh, micrograms of hemoglobin, I mean, the most abundant protein, uh, more or less okay. equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we generally use, so most of the in vitro assays we do, we use 20 micrograms in a 24 well plate, which should be for uh, 200,000 cells, which is, if you do want it in terms of number of EVs, that would be somewhere in the range of 10 to the power, somewhere, somewhere around 10 to the power 10, approximately, molecules of, I mean, 10 to the power individual EVs. Do you have a different result if you put a different uh, ratio of uh, EV? Yeah, so what we do see is generally, I mean, even at low doses, we do see uh, that there is an increase in EV uptake. Uh, we do see the targeting effect. But uh, depending on the dye and what kind of readout you take, if it's RNA, if it's knockdown, uh, if it's just a dye, the strength of the dye, CFSC, calcium AM, you, there is always some variation. So some, some ASOs are much more potent than others. So we do tend to have to vary the dose, but generally we see it works between a dose of five microgram, which is the lowest, actually one microgram. One, uh, microgram. one microgram to up to 100 microgram, we see the targeting effect. So it's a broad range, it works over. Okay, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. I, I guess just to, um... To do a kind of back of the envelope calculation, you'd be talking about uh, something like on the order of 10 to the fifth EVs per cell then in those in, in, in your standard dose. Um, yeah, something along those lines. But I mean, the reason we do, go, we do go that high is because we can actually afford to get a ridiculously large amount of EVs. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah. It, sure. yeah. Sure. Yeah, so and then the other technical question that came in um, from, from two people, Stephen S. and Tom Dredonks, was how are you loading your RNA or your ASO pep, um, or your, your ASOs into the EVs? Yeah, uh, so what we do use is uh, the first paper, the JEV paper, we use, uh, we have used two reagents, two commercial reagents. Exofet, I think, is quite common uh, from SBI, and we also use Reg1. So they are commercial transfection reagents, and uh, we just use them just for the say, just for this study, just to demonstrate the efficacy of the targeting approach, just to show the functional functional release of cargo, and then uh, the ability to have uh, functional knockdown. 
Okay, so um, I know that we're a little bit past the hour, but I do want to give an opportunity to, um, do we have two more questions here from, first of all, Alex. Alex Mock, do you want to go ahead with your question? Sure, Bye. sure. Thanks, this is, this is excellent work. Um, so I have a two-part question. One is, um, can you describe your method for loading calcine AM into EVs and, and where do you believe that label is located on the EVs? Is it um, you know, on, on the surface protein? Is it uh, uh, in the membrane, in the lumen? Um, and then the second question is, uh, it's been demonstrated that varying exogenous labels on EVs can have an effect on in vivo biodistribution. Did you try other labels for your engineered RBC EVs? Yeah, sure. Uh, so with respect to the first question, we did use calcine AM. I think we used calcine AM some, uh, in the first day we paper, but uh, predominantly most of our experiments are done using CFSC. But I mean, more or less the same, both calcine AM and CFSC uh, are cell permeable. So they do enter the cell. In the case of calcine AM, the AM is cleaved off and it's fixed inside the lumen of the cell. So we, what we expect with calcine AM is everything is inside the EV. Uh, so once there's calcine AM diffuses into the EV, the AM is cleaved off, stuck inside because calcine itself is not permeable. It cannot cross the bilayer and then it's inside. And when we wash away, we lose anything that's just outside or stuck on the surface. CFSE is a bit different. It's CFDASE, CF diacetate carboxyproteins, diacetate succinamidal ester. So we see that what we do see is that the diacetate is cleaved once the EV enters, once the CFSC enters the lumen of the EV, and then it's basically NHS. So basically, it just conjugates to any intraluminal protein in the EV but spontaneously using, uh, I mean, it's just conjugation and it's just stuck inside. So we do see that both these dyes are immobilized inside the EV because we do know that our, in, our RBC EVs have the needed enzymes, the esterases, and uh, that are able to cleave off the diacetate, cleave off the AM group. So the result the result is these dyes are immobilized inside the lumen. So that's where we expect to find them. And uh, sorry, your second question was regarding... I think you, you addressed it, but I just was wondering if you had tried other labels uh, for your in vivo experiments. Oh, yeah, of course. So here we use, I mean, in vitro, of course, as you mentioned, we use exclusively C calcine AM and CFSE. In vivo, we use, I mean, we use bioluminescence to track the tumor progression, but here we use DIR. Uh, bioluminescence doesn't really count. Uh, we used... DIR for the tumor uh, biodistribution and also whole organ biodistribution, we use DIR. And yeah, this is just DIR biodistribution just to track the relative EV uptake with and without targeting in the flank tumor after excising the tumor from the mouse. And, and, and have you done experiments where you use a different label in the, uh, outside of DIR? Yeah, so it, of course, I, it's very common in the in the EV field, nanoparticle field, that DIR forms micelles. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so also, so as I said, in vitro is CFSC uh, calcine AM. In vivo is DIR or CFSC. So biodistribution is DIR. And whenever we do DIR, our JEV paper, we included a figure actually where we showed that size exclusion chromatography using we use the ion columns, they are able to efficiently remove any free DIR and DIR micelles. Also for the sake of this experiment, expecting that there may be some artifacts caused by DIR micelles, we also did uh, immunostaining just to verify that this is reliable, that it is actually the real signal. So what we do is we, set, we excise this, the same tumor, the same tumor you see here, following imaging uh, uh, of IVIS, uh, we uh, freeze the tumor, do cryosection, and we do immunostaining with GPA, RBVV marker. And once again, you see that this the reading of from immunostaining corresponds to the reading you get from uh, the DIR. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. And our final question then also has to do with biodistribution. Um, Andrea Silva, do you want to go ahead with yours? Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Really nice work. Uh, my question is related uh, with the targeting of your functionalized EVs. Do you see a redistribution of the vesicles when uh, in your in vivo assays? Meaning, be besides the targeting to your target organs, do you see a reduction in non-specific organs? And what's the implication of that in terms of translation uh, of the application into humans? Yeah, exactly. So actually, I did not include the biodistribution data in this presentation because, uh, I mean, I 
I didn't have a, a space, but uh, we did have a figure in our first manuscript in JV where we do compare the whole organ body distribution. So we have liver, lung, spleen, I think we had brain and heart and lung, uh, lungs, kidney, uh, the whole set, yeah. And what we do see is generally with targeting, we see an increase, we use DIR for that. So we see the fluorescence from DIR, uh, epifluorescence increases with targeting in the tumor. In the basically tumor is the lung because the autotopic lung xenograft. And corresponding with that, we do see a decrease in the liver. Of course, the liver takes up the majority of the EV, so you don't see a uh, drastic decrease, but you are able to see a redistribution just to there you see a reallocation of a portion of the EVs, mostly from, if I remember rightly, it would be the liver and maybe from some of the other organs that these EVs are redistributed to the lung where the tumor is uh, located. Great, thank you. All right, well, thanks everybody for your questions and for attending today. And um, a special thanks to Jay uh, for sharing your work, um, your, your published work, your unpublished work, um, we wish you all the best in your continuing research. Um, and, um, and so uh, everyone, we hope to see you again next week. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Bye now.